Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, starting at verse number 1. And Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that Amalek did to Israel, and how he had laid wait for him in the way, and when he had came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant, suckling, ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. Feel bow your heads and pray. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. So here we have something that the prophet Samuel has given to the new king of Israel. If you go to Exodus chapter 17, verse number 8, then came Amalek and fought with the children of Israel. And <clears throat> we'll see if I can pronounce this right. <laughs> Referred them. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. And I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek and Moses and Aaron and Hurin went up to the top of the hill. And when it came to pass, Moses held up his hand, and the children of Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hurin stayed up his hands. And one on the one side and one on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua dis <clears throat> discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And today what I want to teach about is obedience to God's word. Obedience to God's word. Now when we go back and we, we look at this particular story, there's a lot of messages that can come out of that one story. First of all, Sometimes, when you're following the man of God, he tells you to do something. What you don't see is what he has to do. How many of you have lifted something very heavy? How many of you have lifted something very heavy? Now, how many of you have held it for a very, very long time? Now, how many of you have held a piece of tail? in your hands. Mostly everybody, right? Everybody's held a piece of the towel in their hands. But what happens if you keep holding that towel straight out? Your arms get tired. And so what we see here is, yeah, the children of Israel is having to go fight and they're having to fight this battle, but the man of God is having to hold both of his arms up and try to keep it up. And when he got tired, his arms would go down, and the children of Israel would start losing. And then he would have to raise his arms back up, and they would start winning again. And one of the messages that you could preach is sometimes the man of God needs help, and it takes somebody to grab his arms and hold it up for him. That's the reason why when you pray for somebody, it's good to help hold their arms so they still have a direct path of surrenderance to God. There's message number three out of that. 
But when you look at this set of scripture and where we're going to take our text from is the fact that the Lord told Moses to also to tell Joshua that there will come a day when I will destroy Amalek and his people from this earth. So for years, for years, Amalek and his people was never touched. Do you understand that? For years, they were never touched. Joshua, don't pass on. All the judges, don't pass on. Who's left? Well, the children of Israel started screaming for a king. We need a king. So God gave him one. Gave him Saul. And we go back to chapter 15. And here's Samuel saying, hey, I anointed you the first king of Israel. Now, here's what the Lord says. Go and utterly destroy Amalek. Not just the people, but every single thing they have. It's one thing to take somebody down. It's another thing to destroy their life. What do you mean? It's one thing to take somebody out of remembrance. It's a whole other ball game to utterly wipe them off the face of history. And the sad problem is there has been times that people were utterly wiped from the face of history. There's no records of them. There's no accounts of them. There's not even a time when they were born. Just gone. And this is what God wanted to do to Amalek and his people because of the war that they had raged against his people. And see, sometimes you think that you're fighting a battle and you think the devil's winning. That's not how this works. God remembers the things that happens to his people and he don't forget it. It may not be you that takes down the enemy, but there will come a time where God will look at your children and say, they did this to your father. Now it's your turn to take them out. Sometimes you're going to have to look at the scripture entirely and realize it may not be you that conquers this certain battle. But if you train it into your children, they will come up underneath you and have the strength to take it out. And that's what God was doing. He built Israel up to where they were a kingdom. And he built them an army. And he, he was ready for the king to destroy them. So what happens in 1 Samuel, starting in verse number 4? And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell them 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites. Least I destroy you with them. For ye have showed kindness upon the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So here, Saul comes up and he sees people that were always friendly to God's people. And he tells them, hey, you are amongst some thieves. You're amongst some dangerous people. Leave them. Get away from them. Because if you don't, I'm going to destroy you with them. Now, how many of you would think that they would stay there? Really? You got an entire army waiting in a valley to destroy an entire city? You really going to stay with them? When somebody says, hey, you can go, because I ain't got no problem with you? So a lot of them departed. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havala until 
thou comest near to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, Agog, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, it would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, they destroy utterly. What is he saying here? If you go back to the very first, what did the prophet say? That you are to go and to utterly destroy them. Everything. And what did they do? They spared the king because he was a trophy. They spared the oxen, the best of it. They spared the sheep. They only killed the things that they did not like. That's what they killed. But everything that gave them prestige, they kept. Why? Because it was one of those, look what we did. I captured this king. I destroyed this city. He is my trophy. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Do you not understand that when you don't follow what God commands you to do, it grieves your man of God? Amen. To the point that he has problems and health problems. And if you're not obeying what God says, it grieves the man of God. Because God's coming to him and say, he has turned his face from me. They have turned away from me. And I repent that I ever helped them. I repent that I ever gave them a position. Because they have turned from me. And there's God, have, there's the man of God standing there having to be another Abraham. And stand in the gap. Saying, God, no, just give me a little bit more time with them. Give me a little bit more time. I know that they've done wrong, but maybe I can help them. Maybe I can... Help them see what they're doing. Give me some time. And when Samuel rose up early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Galal. And Samuel said, came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now how brash do you really have to be? When God gives you a commandment, and you completely disobey what God says, but yet you still claiming that you obeyed God. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now here's where Saul hangs himself, so to speak. And Saul said, I have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said unto me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou waste little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and 
utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fought against them until they were to they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst thou fly upon the spool, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, of Amalek and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, now notice, he just admitted that he took the king. God said to destroy them all. He just admitted he took the king. Now, <clears throat> he's going to make another mistake that people do. They're going to pass the blame on to somebody else. Watch this. But the people took of the spool, the sheep and the oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed is sacrificing to the Lord thy God in Goliath. Now here's the problem. He thinks that he was justified because he thinks that he did what God commanded. But he just admitted that he took the king. And then he tried to pass it on to somebody else. Well, these people did it. Have any of you ever been a boss on a job? Have you? What happens if somebody under you does something wrong? Do you think the one that's over you is going to look at them and say, you did this? Are they going to go to you and ask you, why can't they do that? But they did it wrong. Oh, I've told them they did it wrong. Well, obviously, you didn't spend enough time with them to teach them the right way. Some people can walk into a job and pick it up just like that. Some people you got to work with. And you got to spend some time and show them how this works. What do you think the pastor is doing when he comes up here? Some people can get into the church and God opens their eyes and they just they get it. But some people, it takes them a little bit longer, and it takes them time for the pastor to build some things in their lives and to show them how to work. But because of impatience, people destroy them. And people destroy what the man of God has tried so hard to build in people. That's the reason why the Bible says, mark them that cause division among you. And, I don't care if it's your spouse, your family member, your kid, I don't care. The Bible says, and avoid them. Well, how can I do that? If they're your spouse, you should get onto them. Hey, you're causing division. That's not how this works. Uh-uh, we don't do this. If it's your kid, you should spank them. Stop causing division. You're my kid. You won't obey what I say. Right? When, when have we gotten to an age that the parents have to ask permission of the kid to discipline them? Spank that little kid's rear end. They are not your boss. You are their mother. You are their daddy. Act like it. Take authority. And this is the problem that Saul had. He would not utterly take this authority. He was the king. If the people wanted the spools, all he had to tell them was, no, God said destroy it at all. Take them all out. Destroy every single thing. He was the king. He had the power and the command to do it.
But when the man of God calls him out, oh no, no, the people did it. Uh uh, buddy, it's come back to you. You're the one in charge. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So what is he saying? Watch was talking. So what was he saying? He was saying that, listen, what I told you to do was better to do than to get all this good spools and claim it for a sacrifice unto the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And going from that, what happens is Saul begins the path of completely walking away from God. Oh, he admitted in there and says, Saul said in the same, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now it says, Therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship God. Do you get what he just said? Oh yes, I messed up. I will admit, I messed up because I feared the people. I was afraid of what they might say to me. I was afraid of what they might do to me. I messed up. So just forgive me and let's go in and worship Matt like this never happened. Uh Uh-uh. There is still sowing and reaping. And what you sow, you will reap. If you do something wrong, you will reap something wrong. God was going to take you through it. If you deserve a spiritual spanking, he'll give you a spiritual spanking. What does it do? It's not to be hurtful to you. It's not to harm you. It's not to tear you down, but it's to build you up and to realize don't do it again. This is the wrong path. But Samuel said, I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Because of one disobedience, he lost the kingship. Because of one disobedience, he lost the authority that God placed in his life. Because of the one disobedience, he lost his soul. How scary is it when God commands you to do something in the word of God, but because of your disobedience, that one thing can keep you out of heaven. That one little thing that you didn't think was such a big deal keeps you from going to heaven. We've heard this time and time again. It is better to do more for God than not enough. If God convicts something in your heart, it's better to follow that conviction and remove those things from you than just to ignore it. And that one thing could possibly keep you from seeing the face of God. It is a scary thought to get up there on judgment day and hear those words. Depart from me, 
you work over iniquity because I never knew you. Can you imagine? Forget about the fact that he's God, but he is your creator. Can you imagine your creator telling you, I never knew you? The one who made you, the one that was there from the day one, and he still says, I never knew you. That's scary. That's horrifying. That should scare people. That should be something that tugs at somebody's heart to do right. But because Saul disobeyed God, he lost it. He lost it all. And if you keep reading, we all know what happens with David. He gets anointed king of Israel. But Saul's still king. So he has to go through several years of serving Saul. But in the end, it was an Amalekite that took the sword and drove it through Saul. The one people that he set out to destroy, it was the very same sin that come back and killed him and took his life. The very same one. God doesn't forget of unrepented sin. That's the reason why the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. It's not because he was super spiritual. It's because he knew that he was human. And that he could do something that may make him fall from grace. And so every day he repented to make sure that there was nothing between him and God. And yes, it's one thing to ask for forgiveness. But it's a whole other ball game to read the word of God. And ask God to open your eyes to see what you're actually doing wrong. And trust me, when you pray that, God's going to open your eyes. And you start reading this word of God, and you're looking at yourself thinking, Oh, Lord, have mercy. I've been doing that? I can't believe I've been doing that. And there it says right there in the word, I shouldn't do that. And some people do things out of ignorance. It's not that they're doing it on purpose. They just do it out of ignorance because it's all they know. And that's the reason why the Bible says to study to show yourself approved. How do we approve of God's word? By living it. When you walk out and you go in that place and you see all those people that don't have God, they should be able to know that you study the word of God because you are living the word of God. The Bible says that God will write his word on their heart. What is that word? That word is the Holy Ghost. What he said, he said, I will enter into your heart and I will establish my word in your heart. So that when you walk out, people will know that you are my child. You are mine. You have my name now. I am your God. And there is nobody that can take it from you. But if you're not careful and you begin to disobey the things of God, just little things. It's the little foxes that spool the vines if you're not careful. Those little things will drive you from God. And God, in his infinite mercy, will keep reaching and reaching and reaching. But if you keep rejecting it, there will come a time where he'll turn you over to a reprobate mind. Because he can't reach you anymore. Because you've rejected him so long. I know it's quiet this morning. But it's a scary thing to think that you're in the will of God 
when you really ain't prayed about it. You really haven't looked at the Word of God about it. And you really haven't went to your man of God about it. And you walk what you think is the will of God straight out of the will of God. Everybody has a job in their life. There's a five-fold ministry, but there's also helps to those ministry. Do you understand that witnessing is one of the biggest helps that you can do? We have a strong church, but I see a lot of empty seats this morning. There's a lot of seats that people should be sitting in. There's a lot of seats that your family, if you close your eyes, you can see their face. They should be sitting close to you. But here we are this morning. And they're not here. Am I saying you're not trying? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, if it hasn't worked yet, try harder. Pray a little bit longer. Fast a little bit longer. Get in the Word of God and say, God, help me to reach them. Help me to find a way to talk to them. And Lord, if that doesn't work, go after them and do whatever it takes to get them into the house of God. I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be hard, but do something to wake them up. But if we stand by and not do anything, we're disobeying God's word. And it's a scary thing to realize that you were the link to them getting in. You were the link for them to get into church. Do you understand that when one person gets in church, there will be several that will come with them. You know why? Because they're the link that God established. And when you look at all these things in this world, what is it worth compared to God? What is it worth? We're only promised 73 years upon this earth. Now, 73 years looks like a long time, right? But I hear people all the time tell me, time has just flown by. So what is it, these 73 years, what is it in the earth that is worth just a little bit of glory for 73 years compared to to power and the awesome of God for eternity. I don't know about you, but if you put it on a scale, that scale seems a little bit lopsided. And the greater equation is the eternity with God. But I'm going to change this a little bit in the direction. We're going to talk about somebody that disobeyed God. But in the end, he turned around and did God's will. Who was that? That was Jonah. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them people in three days, I'm fixing to destroy you off the earth because of your evil. Three days. And Jonah was scared. You remember what Saul said? I was afraid of the people. You know what Jonah was? Afraid of the people. Is what people think about us really that important? Is it? Is what people say about you really that important? No. But people take that and they're afraid of what people might say or think or do against them. But you can't be that way. 
You cannot be that way. And so Jonah gets on a ship. He's going the other way. Is it Tarsus? Going to Tarsus. He's going the completely opposite direction. He don't want to have nothing to do with Nineveh. And while he's on this ship, he's at the bottom. He's down there. He's comfortable, cozy, not thinking anything about it. Going the complete opposite of the will of God. And then all of a sudden, there comes a storm. And so you got to understand, their ships were not as big as our ships. When we look at it, we may call it a boat now. It would be a very large boat, but we would call it a boat. But it was still a ship that was capable of sea travel. But this storm was so bad that this ship began to take on water, and it started sinking. And these people were so desperate, they started throwing everything out. All their goods, all their wealth, all their cargo. It was meaningless to them when it came to their life. And they started throwing all these stuff out. It is an ironic that when you are at your deathbed, you forget about all the stuff that you have. And you're willing at that time to throw everything out. That didn't work. Boat kept sinking. And so finally they started going around saying, pray to your gods that maybe one of them will spare us. <laughs> Do you understand how crazy that sounds? All these different religions and they're praying to all their different gods hoping one of them will save them. Do you get that? That's crazy. And then they get to Jonah, and they're saying, pray to your God that maybe he will spare us. And Jonah says, I know what I have to do. You've got to throw me over. I know where this storm came from. It's because I didn't follow the will of God. I know what's going on. Throw me over. And they're like, no, 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 no let's not do that. They were desperate. They got so desperate, and they said, you know what? Over you go, buddy. And they chunked him. And you know what happened? The storm quit. Completely quit. And the Bible says that God had prepared a fish. Not just a small little fish that we all go catch. No, he prepared a fish great fish in the Old Testament it was a great fish in the New Testament it was a whale and the scientists will tell you that a whale's belly is not big enough to swallow a human do you think it's ironic that they put in the Bible that God prepared a fish God will prepare anything to get your attention God will put anything in your life to get your attention. And when you look at when you look at that particular thing, God prepared a great fish and it came and swallowed Jonah. How many of you ever went fishing? Raise your hand. How many of you have ever just pulled it up and licked it? Huh? Bet Josh has. How many of you ever just pulled it up, that slimy, nasty, stinky, smelly fish, and just gave it a big old lick? Now, I want you to think about that smell in your mouth and how much you would throw up. <laughs> Now think about this, as bad as it is on the outside, 
How much worse is it inside? And Jonah was in that thing for three days. Three days of nasty, rotten fish, seaweed, anything you could think of in that sea for three days in the stomach where all the acid is. Think about that. I don't know if we've ever been that low. Have you ever been in the belly of a fish for three days? I don't think none of us has ever been that low. But God did whatever it took for the man of God to stop going the other direction and come back and do his will. He did whatever it took to get his attention. And buddy, he took him to the depths of the sea. He took him as low as you could possibly go. And yet, in those three days, the Bible says that Jonah cried out to God in the belly of the whale. Oh, I'm sure he thought that he was dead. I'm sure he thought that this was the end. He couldn't see. It was nasty. It stunk. He was in this fluid. He could not get away from it. And he thought he was dead. And he started begging for God. And then all of a sudden, this fish come up and just puked out Jonah. Now imagine, now I don't know if this is true. I'm just, I'm going to just do a little ad lib here, okay? This is my version. Imagine the people if they were on that beach. I want y'all to think about it for a second. All of a sudden, this big old fish comes up and just spits out this man of all that nasty vomit and his clothes is all messed up from the acid and his hair is all crazy and here comes this fish and bleh. And a guy comes out of it. Can y'all imagine that? You know what happened in 2020? Did you get it? Yeah, I got it too. <laughs> Is that not what would happen? Somebody got their arm cut off. Everybody's filming. Huh? Somebody falls off a building. Everybody's filming. Watch them fall all the way down. Forget about helping them. They want to get the moment. And that's the problem with this world. They're all about the moment. They're all about the feel of the moment. Capturing the moment. The news is all about the moment. But they don't understand what it took to get there to that beach. They don't understand the hell that that man went through to get there. And he walks into Nineveh. They don't say that he ever changed his clothes. They don't ever say that he went and took a shower. He walks into Nineveh, crazy, stinking, looking man. Walks in and tells them, in three days, God's going to kill every one of you because of your sins. Now, if the pastor was in, came out of the belly of a fish and walked in here with nasty, stinking clothes and told every one of us that you're going to go to hell in three days because of your sin, how many of us would actually run to the altar <laughs> right at that particular moment? I would make sure I'm right. And you know what? The king also felt the exact same way I did. Because he put everything on a fast. Even the cats and the dogs were on a fast for three days. Nobody ate. Nobody drank. Anything. Now, can y'all make y'all's little puppy dog take a fast? 
Speaking of puppy dogs, I lost mine yesterday. My little Zoe. She had cancer. And it was rough. It was a rough morning for me. You get attached to those things. Especially something that you take care of. That you spend time with. And you invest into it. And just like that, they're gone. It's rough. But yet this king did not care. He wanted to make sure that everything fasted. And because that they fasted, then God came back to Jonah and said, because they have turned away, turned back to me, I'm not going to destroy them. And you know what the man of God did? He got mad. You put me through all this for me to come here and tell me you're going to destroy them, and now you're not going to do it. But the point was, if he would have went there in the first place, he wouldn't have had gone through all that. See, we always look at our trials and we're like, Lord, why do I have to go through all this stuff? And they're still doing all these things. And you're just going to help them. But if you would have went and helped them to begin with, you wouldn't have had to go through all that. If you would have done what God said to begin with, you wouldn't have had to go through all that. Obedience to God's word is better than sacrifice. If you take anything out of this, Brother John, we tell him I'm ready for him. If you take anything out of this, understand this morning that when the man of God comes up here and preaches something to you, he's not doing it to be mean. He's not doing it to be controlling but he has to deliver the word of God as God commanded him. And it's up to you to obey it. I can't force you to live for God. You can't force me to live for God. You can't force me to live right. I can't force you to live right. We each have to make the conscious decision. We all have a free will in this place. And you have to be willing to obey it's not easy. There are going to be things that's just going to be required of you. That's hard. And you're looking at God thinking, why does it have to be this? And God's saying, because I want you to trust me. If you'll let go of this, I'll give you something better. If you'll stop doing this, I will help you to get closer to me. Is that not the goal of this place? Is to see who he is and to get close to him and personally know him? That's our goal. Do you not understand that's also God's goal? He wants that walk in the garden again. He wants that time that he could walk in the cool of the day and walk with Adam and talk to him. He wants that again. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost, so that he can get us as close as possible to that. So this morning, these altars are open. If there's something in your life that maybe you felt like you haven't obeyed God yet, why don't you give it to him? Turn around. Don't have to go through what Jonah did. Don't have to go through and lose the entire kingdom like Saul did. Don't do that. Just give it to God. And watch what he will do for you. And I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way, I'll say yes.
yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, and I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way I'll say yes, Lord, yes I will trust you and obey When your spirit speaks to me With my whole heart I'll agree And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes I'll say yes Say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart, I'll agree. Yes, I will trust you. 